Welcome to A Look Ahead. We're so glad that you've joined us. We're doing a series on the two, book, the two small books of First and Second Thessalonians. It's a series of 13 lessons, and this is lesson number two. And once again, we're going to focus, as we did last week, on how the gospel came to Thessalonica. Of course, you've got two little books, and you have 13 lessons, so you need to spend a little time talking about background and so forth. So we're going to talk specifically this week how the, what we learned from the Thessalonian letters themselves, what that tells us about Paul's relationship with the people there after he was forced to leave them. And we read in Acts 17, 2, these words, According to his usual habit, Paul went to the synagogue. There, during three Sabbaths, he held discussions with people, quoting and explaining the scriptures and so forth. So we get the impression that Paul was not allowed to spend very much time in Thessalonica. Uh, he was concerned that this period of time might not be long enough to really have established a good relationship with these people in Thessalonians. And I'm, I'm sorry, Thessalonica. Before we go on, however, let, let's, let's just bow our heads and pray together. Our kind and loving Father, we thank you for this opportunity we have to open your word, to look at your promises and your challenges in the books of Thessalonians. May we pick them up and carry them forward to the end of this world's history is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. So, look at what happened next, Acts 17, 5 to 9. But some Jews were jealous and gathered worthless loafers from the streets and formed a mob. They set the whole city in an uproar and attacked the home of a man called Jason in an attempt to find Paul and Silas and bring them out to the people. But when they did not find them, they dragged Jason and some other believers before the city authorities and shouted, These men have caused trouble everywhere. Now they have come to our city, and Jason has kept them in his house. They are all breaking the laws of the emperor, saying that there is another king whose name is Jesus. With these words, they threw the crowd in, and the city authorities into an uproar. The authorities made Jason and the others pay the required amount of money to be released and then let them go. So, we see that while there were some who responded very positively, they were ready to die. We talked about that last week. They were ready to die for the message they received from Paul during that brief time. There were others who did what? stirred up a bunch of ruffians, a bunch of hooligans from the streets and wanted to kill Paul. And what happened? Well, we're not all ignorant. <laughs> Paul had to get out of town quick. Paul had to get out of town quick. And the church member says, you, 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 the time has come, you need to leave. And where did he go? Berea. To Berea. Well, it's a pretty commonly known phenomenon that when a new preacher comes to town, begins to speak of new religious ideas, that the current religious leaders, the current church <coughs> leaders, uh, uh, often become jealous and vigorously oppose the new preacher. We've heard of that happening before. Well, interestingly enough, and we're going to talk about some historical details that you may not have heard of before in the background of this book, Historically, it is well documented that Emperor Claudius became very concerned about what was happening among the Jews in Rome in the year AD 49. Su Suetonius said that there was a real conflict arising in the Jewish community over someone called Crestus. That would be Latin. Who do you suppose they're talking about? As a result, Claudius expelled all Jews from Rome. And let's just look at those, that verse, Acts 18.2. After this, Paul left Athens and went to Corinth. There he met a Jew named Aquila, born in Pontus, who had recently come from Italy with his wife Priscilla, for the Emperor Claudius had ordered all the Jews to leave Rome. Paul went to see them, etc. Now, this is interesting because this is in one of the important ways we have of sort of documenting the timing of Paul's missionary journeys. Because we can get from histor historical record that the, the events of the, the Emperor Claudius, and we can find out when he expelled the Jews, and okay, here, this has to fit, and in fact, the, the, the story does fit. 
it's quite likely that some of those expelled Jews established themselves in Thessalonica. The Thessalonians wanted to be sure that something like what had happened in Rome didn't happen in their city. Okay? Well, Thessalonica was a fairly major city, and it had managed to maintain semi-independence from Rome despite the fact that they were in the middle of a Roman Empire. It was ruled by a group of five or six so-called mayors who collectively decided city issues. Fortunately, those political leaders gave a fair, even-handed response to the accusations made against Paul. Contrast what happened in Philippi, and we've talked about that last week. In fact, let's just review that. Acts 16, starting with verse 22. And the crowd joined in the attack against Paul and Silas. There, then the officials tore the clothes off Paul and Silas, ordered them to be whipped. After a severe beating, they were thrown into jail, and the jailer, jailer was ordered to lock them up tight. Upon receiving this order, the jailer threw them into the inner cell, the, the, you know, this would be maximum security prison, and fastened their feet between heavy blocks of wood. So that's just, you know, and we know what happened later. Nevertheless, the leaders in Thessalonica required the Christians to put up some kind of a bond as security against any further disturbances. It is clear that jealousy can be a very serious threat to the spread of the gospel. What, what, what could we do in our day to try to prevent uh, and avoid such things happening? Pray a lot. Pray a lot. Okay, there's one suggestion. Any other ideas? Maybe getting to know the people you're trying to approach pretty well before you launch into some new idea. That takes time. It takes a, a very sophisticated level of Comprehension. I don't think you'll get everybody, though. No. And no. that's all, the ones you miss are the ones that are going to blow up. Mm -hmm. Well, on some occasions, the actions of new church members or even of the church leadership trying to evangelize others can be at least partially responsible for trouble arising. Look at 1 Peter 3, starting with verse 13. Who will harm you if you are eager to do what is good? But even if you should suffer for doing what is right, how happy you are. Do not be afraid of anyone and do not worry, but have reverence for Christ in your hearts and honor him as Lord. Be ready at all times to answer anyone who asks you to explain the hope you have in you. But do it with gentleness and respect. Keep your conscience clear so that when you are insulted, those who speak evil of your good conduct as followers of Christ will be ashamed of what they say. That sounds like pretty good advice, right? And look at 1 Peter 4, 12 to 16. My dear friends, do not be surprised at the painful test you are suffering as though something unusual were happening to you. Rather, be glad that you are sharing Christ's sufferings so that you may be full of joy when his glory is revealed. Happy are you if you are insulted because you are, the, are Christ's followers. This means that the glorious spirit, the spirit of God, is resting on you. By the way, where was Peter probably when he wrote this? In prison. Probably in prison in Rome, in a very notorious prison known as the Mamertine prison. It's still there, carved out of solid rock. You can visit it. So if any of you suffer, it must not be because you are a murderer or a thief or a criminal or a meddler in other people's affairs. However, if you suffer because you are a Christian, don't be ashamed of it, but thank God that you bear Christ's name. So these two champions of Christianity seem to suggest pretty clearly that if you're going to be a Christian, what's going to happen sooner or later? You're going to be despised, you're going to suffer persecution, right? Well, considering some of the irrational things that the Thessalonians believers were doing following Christ, Paul's visit, it is quite likely that their behavior had something to do with the problems. It is possible that those new converts, had, some of them had stopped their regular jobs, and were spending all their time going around really making religious nuisances of themselves. What Can you imagine if, if you needed something that they had been producing mm -hmm. and they just quit working and were standing out there waving their banners, you'd be annoyed. Mm -hmm. What's a religious nuisance? Someone who comes around and knocks on your door and tries to hand you out literature, stuff that you don't want to read, don't want to have anything to do with, 
And they don't want to hear any of your responses. So. No. <laughs> well, that isn't too bad. I mean, I can just take it, say, oh, thank you, and that's it. Well, that's... Is, is that, isn't there a, even a worse nuisance than that? The ones who won't stop talking. <laughs> I've had experiences when I'm not washing my car, and boy, they want to take up my time. Hmm. Yeah. Well, look at Acts 17, 10 to 15. As soon as night came, the believers sent Paul and Silas to Berea. When they arrived, they went to the synagogue. What did Paul always do when he went to a new city? Went to the synagogue. Went to the synagogue. <coughs> the people there were more open-minded than the people in Thessalonica. They listened to the message with great eagerness, and every day they studied the scriptures to see if what Paul said was really true. Many of them believed, and many Greek women of high social standing, and many Greek men also believed. But when the Jews in Thessalonica heard that Paul had preached the word of God in Berea also, they came there and started exciting and stirring up the mob. At once, the believers sent Paul away to the coast, but both Silas and Timothy stayed in Berea. The men who were taking Paul went with him as far as Athens and then returned to Berea with instructions from Paul that Silas and Timothy should join him as soon as possible. They must have really experienced a contrast in spirit there. Mm -hmm. First, Paul comes in and everybody's listening, talking, and finding out some new things, getting excited, and then, then these people start coming and just, and just for no good reason, just stir up everybody to, to, to run after Paul, to get to try to get him, to kick him out, or to do whatever. And um, so you got these two spirits that are pretty contrasty, and you see them. Well. Um why do you think the response in Berea was different than the response in Thessalonica? Yeah, what, was it just? Yeah? Could be a lot of things. Could be a lot of things. Was it just the Jews in Berea that searched the scriptures, or do you think maybe some of the Greeks? I mean, we we just read that quite a number of Greeks responded to Paul's message. Why would Greeks respond to the Old Testament? Well, they read was probably rational. Yeah, okay. And it answered some, filled in some gaps in their philosophies that they'd heard before and that probably didn't compute, so. It was written in Greek by this time, too, wasn't yes. it? Yes. The Septuagint. Yes. I'm sure it's an, it was an old book even back then. I mean, anything that the Greeks had probably had no history like the Bible did. I mean, the, the scriptures then mm -hmm. did. So that would be pretty interesting, I think. They gave okay. us some insights into history, like you mentioned, that uh, probably wasn't available other places. Well, Paul and John had some pretty strong words to say about listening to new messages. Look at 1 Thessalonians 5, starting with verse 21. Put all things to the test, keep what is good, and avoid every kind of evil. And what about John's words in 1 John 4, 1? My dear friends, do not believe all who claim to have the Spirit, but test them to find out if the Spirit they have comes from God. For many false prophets have gone out everywhere. Does that mean that God wants us even to test messages that come from Him? You can stand scrutiny. That's what, it, in fact, he's, you're, he's honored if you question and, and look into it more deeply. This is not just a doubting kind of a no, thing. No, it's, it's, he's in the teaching business, so mm -hmm. anything he can do to expand your understanding about him, you're on the right track. Well, how are you going to be able to stamp a message from God or not from God unless you test it? You have mm -hmm. to test it. I mean, anything that comes in, that's the first question. Is this from God or is it not? Mm -hmm. and so you test how do you, it. How do you test it to make sure? How do you test it? Make sure there's no evil in it. How do you do that? Yeah, how do you do that? Well, you make sure that there's plenty of good in it. <laughs> <laughs> okay, you're I going like in circles. I love comparing it with what's already been given by God, That's right. comparing it with the Bible. There's one thing that, there's only one test that I know of that's an absolute test for truth. What is that test, do you know? <laughs> if you said it, 
No. <laughs> okay. Doesn't qualify. <laughs> um, Can you think? This is something we, we overlook, but if you stop and think about it, there's only one test that's an absolute one test. test one test, an absolute tooth, absolute okay, test. So according to the law the and to the testimony, if it okay. doesn't, there's no light in them. Okay, and, and how would you express that in, in ordinary common language? Well, if it if, fits with if the it Bible with this. that we've it, had. It has to fit with other parts of reality that you know. That's right. It has to fit. No truth can ultimately be in contradiction from anything else that's truth. So if somebody comes and says, but I have found a new way to look at this, and it's absolutely the truth, and it doesn't mesh with... If it doesn't mesh with what you know already to be truth, then you what better... What if it's somebody that's just off the chart smart? Well, reel a line out to him, and if it's not true, he'll tie himself up in nuts. Give him, give him <laughs> well, time. if it's not true, that means somebody's lying, right? right. Yeah. Well, or that's what you do. You start finding out if there's some lies somewhere. Well, mixing the you know, I have a, you, a very interesting example. Yeah. How do we know that they don't just have a better understanding, a better paradigm yes, than we that's have? That's what I. Okay. So I have come the to truth new still understanding. Truth has to be truth. If it's truth, it has to agree with other truth that we know. And our standard, of course, would be scripture. If somebody has a better paradigm, and then he lies, there, what's going to happen? <laughs> I mean, there's a true story. You just made the made the, par the paradigm moot there, right there. There's a true story told about a debating si society in, in in Ireland that happened some years ago. And one gentleman stood up. He said, "I can use the laws of logic, and even a math logic, and so forth like that." And if you, if you give me a false statement, you, any false statement you like, and I will prove any other false statement using the regular laws of logic. And someone says, ah, come on. He says, well, try me. He says, okay, three equals four. Prove that I'm the Pope. What would you do? Three equals four. Prove he just says, he said, give me one false statement. So here's an obviously false statement. Three equals four. Prove that I'm the Pope. It's, just, it's easy. You, you, in, according to the laws of math, you can subtract equal amounts from both sides. So if we subtract two from each side, we have one equals two. Now everyone knows that you and the Pope are two, so you and the Pope are one. Oh, that isn't logic. That's gobbledygook. No, yeah. it's logic. It's no. gobbledygook. <laughs> no, it isn't gobbledygook. I'm <laughs> saying, I'm saying, I, I'm, I'm just warning you. If, if you start off with the false premise, and what did Satan do in the Garden of Eden? You'd be perfectly logical, but you'd yes. end up at the wrong destination. Exactly. If you start off with the wrong premise, you can use all the right rules and all the right logic, and you'll end up with the wrong conclusion. I didn't see the, any premise there. No, I'm just, the guy said, this was a debating society. Yeah. And they knew the rules of logic. And they knew the rules of math. And they said, he said to them, okay, give me one false statement, Okay, three equals four. That's a false statement. We all know it's a false statement, okay? But it is a false statement. Now, apply the normal rules of, law, of, of logic and, and math, in his case, math, but that's one of the kinds of logic, arithmetic logic, and, and prove that I'm the Pope. And so he said, you know, subtract two from both sides. One equals two. You, everybody knows that you and the Pope are two, so therefore you and the Pope are one, according to that logic. So, this is a way of saying you've got to be careful. If you start off with the wrong premise, you can go anywhere. So, if, but if you start off, if you, if you follow the laws of logic, then if you always start off with something you know to be true, you, you're what? You're protected, right? Start out when you if you start off with the truth, true. see, no truth can be inconsistent with other truth if you understand the relationship between the two. That's the point. Okay, okay. but you could end up going in circular fashion well, with that yeah. kind of logic. So if there's a better paradigm, you'll find that what you're holding to now doesn't match up to all of the rest of the truth. A better paradigm means that you found a better way to put the, the, the facts, the truths, together. Mm -hmm. That doesn't mean that you've changed the truth. It means that you found a better way to put the truths together. Right. 
Well, if you compared what the Israelites had, which was a paradigm different than what God intended, mm -hmm. the truth was still there. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. He changed how they viewed the information that they had. Remodeled it, huh? Yeah. Okay, so now let's get down to where the rubber meets the road. Do we respond to the truth more like the Thessalonians or more like the Bereans? Have we, every one of us, carefully tested the validity of everything that we believe by comparing Scripture with Scripture? How well have Adventists done that? Are we good at it? Well, what happened in 1844? How many Adventists now, with a small a, people who believed in the imminent coming of Jesus Christ, how many Adventists were there on the night before Jesus was supposed to come? Do you know? Lots of them. Hundreds of thousands. There were over hundreds of thousands. Yeah. Six months later, how many Adventists were there? Oh, some 20. A few thousand. A few thousand, maybe two, three thousand that had that has sort of more or less stayed true. What does that tell you? They had a harder head than the other ones? Well, what happened in 1888? Um, the church faced a crisis, and how well did we do? Well, what about today? Do we believe anything for which we do not have adequate evidence? I would remind you of some words that we talked about last week. God never asks us to believe without giving sufficient evidence upon which to base our faith. His existence, that's a pretty basic thing. We, we can't tell people just, you got to believe it. His existence, his character, the truthfulness of his word are all established by testimony that appeals to our reason, and this testimony is abundant. Steps to Christ, page 105. Paragraph 2. What is that telling you? Logic, truth, will be consistent with itself. Okay? Well, there's a lot of things to put together. Mm -hmm. That. And you better check to make sure everyone you put in, in, put in your basket there is true. You're going to put together a paradigm, which is what we're talking about. You better make sure that all the ideas you put in there are true. Well, it's important to be open to new ideas. We don't want to, you know, someone has said, and I firmly believe that if you're worshiping exactly the same picture of God today as you did two years ago, you're worshiping a graven image. You're an idol worshiper. An idol worshiper. But it yeah, is a... Because it's, you're, you're not changing? Because you're not changing and going, right. So um, why do you have to change? The infinite. Oh. More, you should learn more and more about the yeah. Didn't you hit the bullseye the first time? No. <laughs> no. You can't, no. can't possibly know everything there is to know about God the first time. Well, I, I think there's an infinite amount of adjusting that needs to take place. That's, that's why, why you need, that's that's why you need to keep growing. Yeah. It is very important to test those ideas to make sure that they are valid and true and consistent with the rest of our beliefs. So which is a greater problem for Adventists today? One, being too open to new ideas, or perhaps not taking the time and effort to test what we really believe. I think we're very open to new ideas, but the foundation is a little wobbly. Do we test what the Sabbath school teacher says? Don't look at me. <laughs> do, we say, do we test what the pastor says? Are we sure that they're telling us the truth? Well, why do we have to? Because he's up in front. And there must be a reason why he's up in front. Well, I will read you some words that might raise some questions in your mind. These, these are, these, this is three paragraphs from Ellen White's book, Counsels to Writers and Ed Editors, pages, the third paragraph of page 38 through the second paragraph of page 39. This should shake you up. If, if, if it, nothing, if this doesn't, I don't know what will. As real spiritual life declines, are we, are we improving or, Im, or, or getting worse in this, in this statement? Spiritual Think life declines. declines. It has ever been the tendency to cease to advance in the knowledge of the truth. So what are we supposed to be doing? We're supposed to be growing in the truth, right? 
So Man. she's saying right there that if you think you have the truth and you don't need to go any further, that's... That's a problem. That's a problem. You're declining. You're yes. actually declining that. Yes. Okay. Men rest satisfied with the light already received from God's Word and discourage any further investigation of the Scriptures. They become conservative and seek to avoid discussion. The fact that there is no controversy or agitation among God's people should not be regarded as conclusive evidence they are holding fast to sound doctrine. There is reason to fear that they may not be clearly discriminating between truth and error. When no new questions are started by investigation of the scriptures, when no difference of opinion arises which will set men to searching the Bible for themselves to make sure that they have the truth, there will be many now as in ancient times who will hold tradition and worship they know not what. Well, you're talking about controversy there, aren't you? Yes. Well, I've been to a lot of churches, a lot of people saying, got to stay away from this controversy. We don't want to mm -hmm. cause trouble. Divisive. Well, th isn't that good? I mean, well, don't I you want to keep the, people from getting is, mad at each other? Their argument is so you don't want to touch it. Isn't that Christianity? Well, Everybody loves each gross. other and they pat each other on the back and there's no <coughs> arguments, there's Let no me, nothing. Everybody agrees with each other. Let me read the next paragraph. I have been shown that many who profess to have a knowledge of present truth know not what they believe. They do not understand the evidence, evidences of their faith. They have no just appreciation of the work for the present time. When the time of trial shall come, and it will come, there are men now preaching to others who will find upon examining the positions they hold that, they are, that there are many things for which they can give no satisfactory reason until thus tested they knew not their great ignorance. Councils to Writers and Editors 38 and 39. Those are very sobering words. What's happening there? Are they are they discovering that they didn't really know, or what's, do they? Or the people around them saying uh, these guys are crazy? I mean, they don't. Well, what's they don't know what they're talking is, about? Is, is what's happening there is at the end of time, people are going to say, "I need to know the truth. Tell me what's the truth." Oh, here's what I believe. Da da da, and then you find out that they don't know what the truth is. They don't know how to document. They don't know how to support from Scripture what they believe is true. And so they'll they say, start talking, and then they start asking questions, and uh, and they know. say, get get lost. You're not helping me a bit. You don't know what you believe. Let me find someone who knows what they're talking about. So we're supposed to be asking questions and seeing if the answers make sense. Exactly. Well, not just make sense. That's that's logic. But those answers, those answers that make sense, have to be based on solid scripture. So some, when somebody comes up to you and says, so why do you believe? What you better be have a reason. What did Peter say? Always be ready to give to anyone who asks you a reason for the hope you have in you. Okay? First Peter 3, 15. That comes from hard discussions. That comes from hard discussions and careful study of the Scripture. Careful study. So it looks like the answer is not necessarily agreeing with each other, but still respecting each other. Respecting each other. I mean, you still... Even this guy, you got some crazy ideas. I'm not going to get mad at you about it. I still respect you, yes. and that I knew that I know those ideas have come to you for some reason, mm -hmm. so you still respect them, and that's that's what hap that's what doesn't happen in the church. People yeah. blow up. Mm -hmm. They start getting mad at people. They start yelling. They start screaming. They start saying, "Get this guy out of here! Yeah, I don't want to be." Ideas. Yeah. Yeah. So what we're saying here is there are two aspects to establishing a, a correct and, and savable paradigm. One, it's first of all based on solid scripture. And two, it's based then on putting those solid pieces of evidence together in a logical framework. But you get that through patience with each other. Careful, You've gotta be talking, patient and thinking. With each other. Yeah. And, and, and I might learn something from Jim, and I might learn something from you, and I might learn something from Caleb, and I have to figure out how to put that all together. It's very disturbing if you find pieces of evidence from people that you trust 
that don't seem to agree. You know, if you think about it, if God looks at your intelligence and what you know, he's got to think you're pretty ignorant. I <laughs> well, mean, when you course. start thinking about the universe and everything he knows about, and everything that happens, it doesn't mm -hmm. happen in secret from him, mm -hmm. he looks at you and says, okay, but he still values you, even though you yeah. don't have everything Here, straight you in your mind. You didn't look at your children as dumb children when they were little, they were still learning. Well, I think this respect that God has for their, his dumb children should come to all of us yes. with each other as yes. far as what we know. I mean, hopefully that as time goes on, we'll keep talking back and forth which, and you'll know which, yeah. why this person believes the way he does and he'll know why you believe the way you do. And that's all more information for you to sort out. Yeah. We, we, learn, we must learn how to respectfully ask questions. Respectfully and be respectful. Mm -hmm. yeah, no matter what they say, actually. Yeah. If somebody comes in your Sabbath school and says, I believe in evolution, mm -hmm. what are you going to do? Are you going to get all upset and throw him out? I mean, there's a possibility that maybe through some time, you know, in discussion, that he may turn, you know. Mm -hmm. Or whatever. Well, you might learn something. Or I might learn something. I might learn. <laughs> I might learn why he's believing that, and I I have to go and dig down deeper to find out what I could do. Well, has the Christian Church ever made mistakes? <laughs> you bet. Do we, as individuals, need to do our own research to be certain that what we believe is true? Mm -hmm. Have there been times when the Christian churches? have made significant mistakes. What about the time when the early believers at Jerusalem asked Paul to prove he was a real Jew? And, and it resulted in Paul's imprisonment. What about switching from Sabbath to Sunday as a day of worship? Was that a good thing for the church to do? Or persecuting the Walden Seas and other similar groups during the Dark Ages? What about the Crusades? Was that a smart thing to do? How about accepting pagan ideas about the immortality of the soul? Did the Adventist Church respond correctly to the message presented in 1888? Did the Adventist Church always respectfully listen to Ellen White? Do they now? Do they now? Boy. Well, no, now look at Paul's approach to the large city of Athens. There are many pagan philosophers and debaters located there, and they, the Athenians in ancient times, they love to debate. Uh, look at Acts 17, 2 and 3, for example. According to his usual habit, Paul went to the synagogue. This is Thessalonica. There, during three Sabbaths, he held discussions with people, quoting and explaining the scriptures and proving for them that the Messiah had to suffer and rise from death. This Jesus, whom I announced to you, Paul said, is the Messiah. So that was his basic premise. That's the kind of approach he took. <coughs> now look at verses 16 to 34. While Paul was waiting in Athens for Silas and Timothy, he was greatly upset when he noticed how full of idols the city was. So he held discussions in the synagogue with the Jews and with the Gentiles who worshipped God, and also in the public square every day with the people who happened to pass by. So what's Paul doing here? Isn't he sampling? He's, he's, he's getting familiar with their thinking. He's, he's getting, you know, getting familiar with Athens. Certain Epicurean and Stoic teachers also debated with him. Some of them asked, what is this ignorant show-off trying to say? Others answered, he seems to be talking about foreign gods. They said this because Paul was preaching about Jesus and the resurrection. So they took Paul, brought him before the city council, the Areopagus, and said, we would like to know what this new teaching is that you're talking about. Some of the things we hear you say sound strange to us, and we would like to know would like to know what they mean. For all the citizens of Athens and the foreigners who live there like to spend all their time telling and hearing the latest new thing. Is that a good way to spend your time? Usually not. Well, That's why they spend all their time according to the way it reads here. Yeah, exactly. So... Well, it was their hobby. Yeah. <laughs> so what happened? It is clear that Paul took a different approach when dealing with Jews than he did with people not familiar with the Jewish faith. When entering Athens, Paul spent some time walking around the city, talking to people to get familiar with their ideas. He talked to the Jews in the synagogue, 
We, when entering any new area, it is important for us to listen and learn about the ideas and beliefs of the people we are trying to reach. One good place to get ideas about people's belief is in the marketplace. There was a large marketplace very close to the Areopagus or Mars Hill in Athens. You can still see it there today. As Paul asked questions, he attracted the attention and curiosity of some of the Epicurean and Stoic philosophers. They invited him to address the intellectuals of Athens at the Areopagus. Paul began his discussion with those philosophers talking about creation. Well, both he and they were interested in that subject. Paul quoted from their very own philosophers and poets. And I can tell you, it's interesting, that if you happen to travel from, if you happen to visit Athens, and you're up on the, up on the high hill around uh, the Parthenon, and then you travel down a short distance and over to Mars Hill, to the Areopagus, you travel up a short bit of stairs to reach up onto the Mars Hill, and carved right in the rock there, beside the little path that leads up, is this message from Paul. The word straight out of the Greek Bible. So, Paul, um, well, he talks about creation, and he did this so that they would look for him and perhaps find him, talking about God, and as they felt about for him. Yet God is actually not far from any one of us. As someone has said, and now Paul actually quotes from their own philosophers and poets, in him we live and move and exist. It is, some of your, it is as some of your poets have said, we too are his children. So, do you think that impressed them? Well, there's another interesting thing to think about here. Why do you think the Athenians were worshipping an unknown god? Cover their bases? Well, it turned out there were many altars to the unknown gods in Athens. 600 years earlier, before this, there was a terrible pestilence that, they had, that had fallen into the city, which nothing could seem to abate or to stop or halt. A Cretan port by the name of Epimenides had come forward with a plan. A flock of black and white sheep were let loose throughout the city from the Areopagus. Wherever each lay down, it was sacrificed to the nearest god. And if a sheep lay down near the shrine of no known god, it was sacrificed to the unknown god. From this situation, Paul takes his starting point, and from there, a series of sermons developed a series of, of steps in his sermons. One, God is not the made, but the maker. And he who made all things cannot be worshipped by anything made by the hands of man. It is all too true that men often worship what their hands have made. If a man's God be that to which he gives all his time, thought, and energy, many are clearly engaged in worshipping man-made things. Two, God has guided history. He was behind the rise and fall of the nations in the days gone by. His hand is on the helm of things now. God has made man in such a way that instinctively he longs for God and gropes after him in the darkness. The days of groping and ignorance are past. So long as men had to search in the shadows, they could not know God, and he excused their follies and their mistakes. But now, Christ, the full blaze of the knowledge of God, has come and the day of excuses is past. The day of judgment is coming. Life is neither a progress to extinction as it was to the Epicureans, nor a pathway to absorption to God as it was for the Stoics. It is a journey to the judgment seat of God where Jesus Christ is the judge. The proof of the preeminence of Christ is the resurrection. It is no known God, it, I'm sorry, it is no unknown God, but a risen Christ with whom we have to deal. And that's a summary taken from William Barclay's Delhi Study Bible, the article on Acts 17, 22 to 31. Well, interestingly enough, it is possible to precisely date the events in the ministry of Paul noted in Acts 18, 1 to 18, by their intersection with certain events in history that can be clearly dated. Claudius's expulsion of the Jews from Rome occurred in AD 49. The proconsul Gallio, who was in Athens in Paul's day, ruled in Corinth, I'm sorry, in Corinth in Paul's day, ruled in Corinth in AD 50 and 51. While critical scholars and unbelievers often try to claim that the biblical record is unreliable, these are two events which clearly nail down the historicity of Paul's ministry on his second missionary tour. Is it important for us to nail down things like that? 
you know, it was just an interesting trivia as we go by. If it didn't fit with history that we know from other sources, then we'd be concerned. We mm -hmm. should be concerned. Yes, but it does fit. Well, despite his best efforts, the response in Athens to Paul was apparently not very good. There were, some, there were some prominent citizens who became Christians. However, when Paul moved on to Corinth, he decided to take a different approach. And that approach is discussed in 1 Corinthians 1, starting with 18 through chapter 2, verse 2. For the message about Christ's death on the cross is nonsense to those who are being lost, but for us who are being saved, it is God's power. The scripture says, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise and set aside the understanding of the scholars. So then, where does that leave the wise? Or the scholars? Or the skillful debaters of this world? God has shown that this world's wisdom is foolishness. For God in his wisdom made it impossible for people to know him by means of their own wisdom. Why, why would he say that? Can you discover God by your own wisdom? It seems as though God comes to us first somehow. Mm -hmm. If God had not chosen to reveal himself, where would you go to find out about him? Where would you, well... We can uh, find him in nature. But, that's but he has revealed himself, himself through there. nature. That's another way he reveals himself. One, uh, hmm? for what can be known about God is plain to them because God has shown it to them. See, God's showing, demonstrating, teaching. Yep. Ever since the creation of the world, his invisible nature, mm -hmm. namely his eternal power and deity, has been clearly perceived in the things that have been made. You're reading from Romans 1. Romans 1. Yeah. yeah. So, in other words, we are totally dependent upon God's revelation of himself, whether it's through Scripture or through nature, as to what we know about him. If he had chosen not to, dem not to reveal himself in any way, we would live in total chaos and we wouldn't have a clue. So, Jews want, going back to 1 Corinthians, Jews want miracles for proof. Greeks look for wisdom. As for us, we proclaim the crucified Christ. By the way, how did we first come to be called Christians? Do you know? The name? Yeah. Because they worship a dead man. Yeah. Back in Acts, it says in, 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 in um, Antioch. Antioch, Paul's home church, in that area, the church was growing, expanding so fast and making all sorts of progress and so forth. The people around started calling these people Christians. Now, we think Christian is a royal name. It belongs to Christ. They didn't think it was a royal name. They said these are those dumb people who are worshiping a dead man. So that was the origin, the origin of, the, of the name of Christian. So um, I thought Christ meant the anointed one. Yeah. Okay, is it, then why is Christian so close to Christ if it means worshiping a dead man? Well, how, do, how does that okay, work? How descriptive in the name. The Messiah... It was the original name. That was Hebrew. Christ is Greek, and it, re it refers to an anointed. Someone, not necessarily, it doesn't have to be a Messiah. Someone who is anointed for a particular position. Okay? So it doesn't just automatically imply something sacred and holy. And so, so are you saying that they called him an anointed dead man? Well, yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. They're saying, here was this Christ that you worship. Well, what happened to him? He died. And you're saying he rose from the death? Why should we believe that? You know, a bunch, you're a bunch of people are following a dead man. That was, that was the, I mean, recognizing this is the, these are the accusations of the ignorant, but that's, mm -hmm. that's what they said. Mm -hmm. So, but for those whom God has called, both Jews and, Jews and Gentiles, this message, the message, this message is Christ, who is the power of God and the wisdom of God. For what seems to be God's foolishness is wiser than human wisdom, and what seems to be God's weakness is stronger than human strength, and so forth. Okay? So Paul did not consider his time getting familiar with the people in Athens a waste at all. He recognized the essential progress 
I'm sorry, process of getting to know where people are and then meeting them there. And proof of that is in 1 Corinthians 9, 19 to 23. Meeting people where they are is certainly not a precise science. It requires careful attention and effort on our part. Therefore, Paul took a different approach in each city to which he went, considering the circumstances in that city. Well, um, there's a very interesting passage in 1 Thessalonians 2, starting with verse 17. Actually, before I read that, however, I want you to read some other verses. Paul had some very strong beliefs. He was absolutely committed to those beliefs. And you can read about that in Galatians 1, 2, 3, and 4. Let me just pick the verses from Galatians 1, 6 to 9, and see how convicted you think Paul was, or how committed he was. I'm surprised at you. Now, this is talking to the Galatians. In no time at all, you're deserting the one who called you by the grace of Christ and are accepting another gospel. Actually, there is no other gospel. But I say this because there are some people who are upsetting you and trying to change the gospel of Christ. But even if we or an angel from heaven should preach to you a gospel that is different from the one we preach to you, may he be condemned to hell. I'm reading my Good News Bible. We have said it before, and now I say it again. If anyone preaches to you a gospel that is different from the one you accepted, may he be condemned to hell. Did Paul believe in what he be, I mean, did he, was he convinced about what he believed? He was convinced that that came from God. Yes. Well, we might get the idea from that, that Paul didn't care too much about the feelings of other people. Um, we, we could have read on in Galatians 2, where he, he criticized Peter, and he, 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 you know, he, right there in public. You aren't living the way you're supposed to, brother. Well, does that mean that Paul was just were walking roughshod over everybody's position and their, their ideas and their emotions. Well, look at these words about Paul and from Paul. As for us, brothers and sisters, when we were separated from you for a little while, not on our thoughts, of course, but only in body, how we missed you and how, we, how hard we tried to see you again. We wanted to return to you. I myself tried to go back more than once, but Satan would not let us. Okay, there we are again. How is Satan preventing Paul from going back to Thessalonica? Now the Spirit, the Holy Spirit, and the Spirit of Christ, we read before, back in Acts uh, 16, sort of told him, okay, you have to go over to Macedonia. And now, now that he's been through Macedonia and down into Achaia, he wants to go back and Satan's Spirit is preventing him. How do you suppose that happened? Well, one was kind of directing, the other one was preventing. I see. <laughs> well, after all, it is you, you no less than others, who are our hope, our joy, and our reason for boasting of our victory in the presence of our Lord Jesus when he comes. Indeed, you are our pride and our joy. Finally, we could not bear it any longer, so we decided to stay on alone in Athens while we sent Timothy, our brother who works with us for God, and preaching the good news about Christ, we sent him to strengthen you and help your faith so that none of you should turn back because of these persecutions. You yourselves know that such persecutions are part of God's will for us. So, is that a balance to what we might have thought earlier about Paul? He was, he had those emotions. He, he, he felt strongly about being separated from the Thessalonians, right? He was delighted when Timothy came back and reported that the Thessalonian believers felt the same about him as he felt about them. This was a good report. It made a huge difference in Paul's ministry. It reaffirmed his sense of personal worth. It probably strengthened his desire to see them again. So Paul sent Timothy back twice to carry letters from him to those new believers. How well do we do at following Paul's example when dealing with new believers? Well, here's some sobering words from Ellen White. If we would humble ourselves before God and be kind and courteous and tender-hearted and pitiful, there would be 100 conversions to the truth where now there's only one. Whoa. But though professing to be converted, 
we carry around with us a bundle of self that we regard as altogether too precious to be given up. It is our privilege to lay this burden at the feet of Christ and in its place take the character and similitude of Christ. The Savior is waiting for us to do this. Ellen White, Testimonies of the Church, Volume 9, pages 189 and 190. What do you think is implied by the idea we're carrying around a bundle of self? I'm more concerned about me rather than God. And how would that prevent us from winning a hundred times more people to the gospel? We're not presenting Christ to them. We're presenting a church. A, a when we are afraid to witness somebody, what are we worried about? What they'll think about us what they'll think about us, right? Well, well it might be that um, you don't have that bundle of self when the Spirit is with you. Mm -hmm. So um, when the Spirit is with you, then the hundreds of people get converted when there's only one. Show me. Hmm? Show me. Well, it's just a theory. Oh, no, no. <laughs> I want to see this in action. Well, I want to see it in action, too. Yeah. Well, in what sense do Christians in 2012 need to do, die to self? How can we accomplish that? What factors keep us from speaking to acquaintances and friends about the gospel? What part of what we believe may seem strange to those who do not fully understand our message? How do others respond when we talk to them about the great controversy, for example? Can you mention just a few of our Adventist beliefs, or maybe your personal beliefs that, that some other Christians or other, even other Adventists might uh, wonder about what you're talking about? Even the idea of Satan, the existence of Satan is questioned. Many Christians, Christians don't even believe that Satan exists. What else? Mention anything else? <laughs> what are the things we talk about all the time, we Adventists? Um, Worshiping on the Sabbath. Yeah. What else? State of the dead. The, the, the nature of man or the state of the dead we talk about, yes. The non-immortality of the soul. <laughs> How about the character of God? What about the character of God? Now there's an interesting point. Who talks about that? Well, Becoming true Christians requires a complete shift in behavior and thinking for the new Christian. Every aspect of his life, physical, mental, and emotional, needs to be involved. How can we help one make that transition? We need to stay closer to him, her, or as she, he works his, her way through these new issues. If we abandon people once they are baptized, we are almost assuring the fact that sooner or later they will leave. Are we prepared to make the, that kind of commitment to new believers? How do we go about that, doing that? How do we balance our time and energy to include this kind of ministry? Should we leave our jobs to start preaching like Paul did? What would happen if we did? Or should we, like Paul, sometimes work all night so we can preach during the day? I mean, literally, how much of our, what percentage of our time and efforts goes into things that might somehow contribute to the finishing of the gospel. If you'd like to look at the materials we're looking at as we talk about these lessons, they're available on our website. You can go to theox, that's T-H-E-O-X dot O-R-G. It stands for Theological Crossroads. We want to incorporate different ideas, things that will stir up people's thinking and thinking about the gospel. Well, Paul was so moved by issues that he felt he couldn't stand any longer, he had to send Timothy off to back to Thessalonica. We need to constantly keep in mind the fact that bringing new members into the church means that we bring them into our circle of friends and into our lives as well. We need to find ways to close the back door of the church. 
Often those who leave do so not because they have stopped believing what they learned, but rather because they do not really feel like they are part of the church. They may be intellectual Adventists, but they're not relational Adventists. So go back to Acts 17, 1 to 4, and look at those verses. Paul and Silas traveled on through Amphipolis and Apollonia and came to Thessalonica, where there was a synagogue. According to his usual habit, Paul went to the synagogue. There, during three Sabbaths, he held discussions with the people, quoting and explaining the scriptures and proving from them that the Messiah had to suffer and rise from death. This Jesus, whom I announced to you, Paul said, is the Messiah. Some of them were convinced and joined Paul and Silas, so, so did many of the leading women and a large group of Greeks who worship God. Does that sound like Paul had a fairly significant impact on the people in Thessalonica? Well, it's important to notice that a wide variety of people accepted Paul's message in, in Thessalonica. Christianity is supposed to appeal to all groups. Jason was apparently a fairly well-to-do Greek-speaking Jew. Aristarchus was a Jewish Christian who was, went to prison with Paul, etc. Who were the unbelieving Jews who chased Paul out of, Corinth, out of Thessalonica? Apparently, some of the unbelieving Jews raised up some rabble to stir up trouble. The Greek expression means literally, men of the marketplace. They were unemployed ruffians who hung out in the marketplace looking for something to do. What a contrast they present to the faithful believers in Thessalonica and Berea. These unbelieving Jews and the group of ruffians attracted, attacked the home of Jason, forcing, him, forcing their way in as they were looking for Paul and Silas, etc. Well, the word referring to their separation, Paul talks about how he, had to, he was forcibly separated from the Thessalonians. That word can be translated torn away or literally to make an orphan. It is actually orphanize of someone. Paul felt like his children had been torn away from him. Did Paul and Silas ever doubt that their call to Macedonia was a valid one after this? In this lesson, we have noted that evangelizing new members involves a lot of change, not only for the new members, but also for us. Are we prepared to make the commitments necessary? Do we know how to do it with love and compassion? We have a challenge before us to try to imitate Paul as he imitated Christ. See you next week.